As millions of Americans are tuning in to watch a Super Bowl this Sunday like raving onlookers in an ancient coliseum waiting to witness the clash between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Philadelphia Eagles or to watch and subsequently talk about the halftime commercials, some of the most expensive ad spots on TV. Yo, this is a bomb. I can't help but to think about how the Super Bowl is the biggest spotlight for artist exploitation. It's a spectacle unto itself with its front and center over-the-top production, complicated choreography, dancers, vocal performances, fireworks, lighting, costume design, and a surprise guest or two. Yet, while everyone is sitting back and enjoying the game, marveling at the sophisticated musical arrangement, I'm wondering why none of the artists are paid. None, as in zero. Did you know this? Sadly, it's been this way forever. So it got me thinking, wherever there is big business, name brand association, the allure of attention, future rewards, and undetermined revenue, there will always be a line of artists eagerly waiting to be exploited. We're not talking about some up-and-coming musical acts that could use the exposure to jumpstart their careers. I'm talking about established, chart-topping artists, Grammy-winning rock and roll Hall of Famers with massive fans and millions of albums sold. That's right. Your favorite acts like Eminem, Maroon 5, Beyonce, Usher, Coldplay, and this year's headliner, Rihanna, all working for free. Now, why would they need to work for exposure? Here's what we know. It's 2023 and the Super Bowl isn't paying its halftime talent. A yellow flag should be thrown. The refs, you and me, are blind. Something is wrong here. According to the National Retail Federation, the Super Bowl is likely to generate over 16 billion, with a B, billion in nationwide spending. With multiple revenue streams like partnerships, tickets, sponsorships, ad sales, merch, and local cities bidding to host the event, they aren't going broke. It is estimated that NFL will make over 60 million from ticket sales alone. Advertisers will spend up to $7 million on a 30 second ad clip, and major TV networks will pay close to $3 billion for the rights to broadcast the NFL games, including the Super Bowl. If they're swimming in cash, why does none of it go to the creative talent? Is this truly artist exploitation or simply good business? So let's take a look back. During the decade from the 1960s to the 70s, the Super Bowl was more about entertaining the existing crowd rather than grabbing new eyes through television. In the beginning, college marching bands had the spotlight. The first Super Bowl, held January 15, 1967, the Green Bay Packers against the Kansas City Chiefs celebrated halftime with the Grambling State University Tiger Marching Band, followed the next year by seven Miami area high school bands. What started with humble beginnings soon became a stage for celebrities and well-known talent. By 1972, the halftime show featured American actress Carol Channing and the Queen of Jazz, Ella Fitzgerald. But... By the 90s, the halftime show was starting to lose viewership. The singing group, Up With People, had performed four Super Bowls. The group had been born out of a controversial World War II era religious movement called Moral Rearmament. Much of the Up With People organization was backed by corporate America, which wanted to promote a business-friendly image at the time. Many believed it was a deliberate propaganda effort to turn people away from the liberal counterculture of the 60s and 70s a time when race rights and feminism were on the rise. The performances weren't resonating with the cultural, political, and ideological shifts felt by the average citizen. In 1992, the Super Bowl would air on the CBS network. And at the time, Fox, a rival network, aired an episode of the sketch comedy series In Living Color during the halftime period. Viewership of the rest of the game dropped by an astonishing 22%, or in other words, In Living Color had pulled 22 million viewers from the game. Counter-programming against the Super Bowl had grown to give viewers an alternative to the halftime show, with some networks airing one-off special presentations and previews of new series. The NFL decided it wasn't going to sit back and watch their views drop. They sought to book in-demand celebrities and pop music acts, and the year later, the king of pop himself Michael Jackson was set to take the stage. Leading up to the performance, the NFL had been through back and forth negotiations with Michael and his team who were asking for a million dollar appearance fee. Although the amount was denied, the NFL and Frito-Lay did agree to make a base donation of $100,000 
to Michael's charity, the Heal the World Foundation. They also agreed to give commercial time during the game to the foundation's Heal LA campaign, which sought to help LA youth by providing drug education, healthcare, and mentorship. Jackson's 1993 performance was iconic and set the stage for other large acts to follow. Billboard reported that Jackson's album, Dangerous, rose from number 88 to 41 on the Billboard 200 chart, selling over 50,000 units for the next six weeks straight. Since the show, other big names like Bruno Mars, Janet Jackson, Diana Ross, Shakira, Lady Gaga, and more have all entertained during halftime. And all of them weren't paid. According to the Daily Mail, NFL spokesman Greg Aiello said, we pay the production cost for the halftime show. There is no fee for the artist. Some artists even provide their own funding to make their shows more memorable. The Weeknd, for example, reportedly added $7 million of his own money to create what he envisioned. So why does it matter that these artists aren't getting paid if they're willing to put on a show? It's something that all creatives know too well. They trade their craft, time, skills, and energy in exchange for exposure. And if these major artists are willing to work for free, it gives the NFL an excuse to not pay other creatives working to make their show special. For example, even some dancers go unpaid as the NFL recruits them as volunteers. Taja O'Reilly, dancer and athlete, spoke up after her experience during the 2022 Super Bowl. Riley shared with Dance Magazine that there were eight mandatory rehearsals, one non-disclosure agreement, and zero pay. Instead, Dancers would spend hours upon hours perfecting their moves in exchange for the exposure opportunity of a lifetime. In other words, they get to put the word Super Bowl on their resume. Is it a smart business decision for the NFL to not pay creatives? Of course. Instead of having to pay millions of dollars on top of production, insurance, and travel fees, they can now add more money to their profit. It's genius, really. If you can convince an artist to work for exposure dollars, you get to put on a great show and keep the cash for yourself. Unfortunately, it sets a precedent for the rest of the industry and trickles down to the smaller creators. There are no guarantees when working for exposure. Although it is reported that music streaming after the 15-minute show increases, such as Shakira's Spotify streams after performance, increasing by 230% and JLo's by 335%, nothing is truly guaranteed. An artist could give a lackluster performance reach the wrong audience, or simply have an off night. Artists are essentially gambling their time in hopes of a return. Not to mention creators spend a huge amount of time and money to master the craft. There could also be a fear of missing out, you know, FOMO. If an artist says no to performing at the Super Bowl, it's likely that another artist will say yes. There will always be someone willing to do it for less, but it doesn't always mean that's the right thing to do. Plus, if the halftime show is only open to artists can afford to work for free, which often comes from a place of privilege, seeing as most have already made a sizable income from their work, that means the show will only ever be influenced by people who can afford to make that decision. It takes away the likelihood of giving opportunities to up-and-coming artists or bands, limiting the audience's chances of hearing something fresh and new. It even got so bad that the NFL tried an idea to get artists to pay to be able to perform. So not only were they not getting paid, now they're actually paying for the privilege of exposure. That sounds pretty crazy to me. What can creators learn from this? Well, as frustrating as it is, it's a lesson to other creators. Businesses will almost always try to get the best deal for themselves. Your power, your only power is to withhold your services from businesses by saying no. And like Michael Jackson, if you're the greatest of all time, you'll get paid eventually. They'll pay you if that's the only way they can have access to you, and you are one of one. This year, Rihanna's headlining the halftime show. Although she's not getting paid, she did get creative. She signed a deal to film a documentary for Apple TV, showing the ins and outs of her performance, taking viewers behind the scenes from rehearsals to the moment of the halftime show itself. Where there is a will to make money and get paid for your talents, there is a way. So to recap, yes, the NFL and one of the most significant, most profitable events of the year make a choice to pay the talent in exposure and find a way to include unpaid volunteers. Although choosing to work for exposure is a personal choice and will look different for everyone, 99% of the time, it's a bad idea 
And I would argue that the Super Bowl is no exception. So what do you think? Should these artists be working for the Super Bowl for free? And would you do it? Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you enjoy this kind of content, let us know. I'll make more of these. If you don't like it, let us know too, and we'll do something else. That's it for me. I'll see you in the future.